Okay, hi everybody, and uh, thank you for coming. I'm very, very impressed uh, that uh, you're coming out in this uh, weather, and uh, I do want to apologize for last week. Uh, I actually was ready to go, but I literally, uh, I would normally take a bus, but I, I left late enough that I needed to take a cab, and literally there were no cabs uh, available, <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't have gotten here on time uh, with the bus and the light, uh, light rail. But Baruch Hashem, uh, I'm here tonight, and I appreciate your coming tonight. Uh, so this year is dedicated uh, for a Rafua Shlema for Chaim Aryeh ben Rivka, Emuna Chaya bat Shlema Devora, and Sara Chana Bashena. Oh, that's my wife, yeah. And Be'ez Hashem, uh, we wish that all of them should have a Rafua Shlema, the Toch Sharchola Yisrael, in the merit of the uh, Torah learning that we are doing. Uh, in addition, once again, tonight's uh, class is sponsored by an anonymous donor. Uh, very grateful. Thank you, uh, Mr. or Mrs. or Miss uh, Anonymous. Uh, and may you also have the great reward of Hakzakas Torah. Uh, this Parsha is, of course, uh, a very, very significant Parsha. Uh, this is the Parsha of Matan Torah. This is the Parsha which not only is the raison d'etre of the Exodus itself, the purpose of the Exodus was that we would become a free nation, able to receive God's Torah. So it's not only the purpose of the Exodus, but it is the purpose of the creation of the world itself. There are 26 generations from Adam to Moses. 26 generations. And uh, it mentions in the Medrash, that those 26 generations were only living on divine chesed. There was no real reason, including Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, there was no real reason for the world to exist until the Jewish people accepted God's Torah. That's why in, uh, the, in Tehillim, uh, the refrain, ki li olam chasto, God's loving kindness is forever, is 26 times indicating that the 26 generations prior to Matan Torah are only living on chesed. So this is the great day, the great day of Matan Torah, the, the, the day that we celebrate as the holiday of Shavuos. But once again, the term Matan Torah is a little bit of an ambiguous term because obviously we didn't get the whole Torah on that day. We only got the Ten Commandments. The rest of the Torah is actually given over a 40-year period. I mean, many events happen later. So one of the interesting questions is, is the Ten Commandments more important than the rest of the Torah? You know, a lot of, a lot of Jews often say, a lot of people often say, well, I'm not so religious, but I keep the Ten Commandments. So actually, Rabbi Emanuel Feldman, a uh, retired rabbi who was a great rabbi in Atlanta, now his son has been the rabbi for a number of years, tells a story that in the early years of his rabbinate, uh, there was a woman who used to come over and she'd like to schmooze, she'd like to just talk. And normally, you know, he, she was not that observant, but you know, normally he would have nice conversations with her. But sometimes he was busy and he would be a little curt, a little short. So she always had the same line. Every time she would come in, she'd begin every conversation by saying, Rabbi, you know, in a southern accent, Rabbi, I'm not as observant as you, but I keep the Ten Commandments. So I'm a good Jew. So Rabbi Feldman would normally just smile and nod and, you know, whatever it was. But that day he was a little irritated. So he said, oh yeah? What about the Fourth Commandment? The Fourth Commandment is, remember the day of Shabbos to keep it holy. So she's thinking for a minute, and she said, what's the fourth commandment? What, which one is that? He says, remember the day of Shabbos, which she wasn't keeping Shabbos. Which means when people actually say they keep the Ten Commandments, they usually mean they keep the last five commandments, because the last five commandments are don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, uh, don't uh, give false testimony. 
and don't covet. By the way, even the last five are not so easy to keep as we think. All right, most of us, thank God, go through life without killing, without stealing, hopefully without committing adultery, and at least in a court setting, we don't give false testimony. But you know what the real hard one is in that uh, last list of five? Do not covet, do not be jealous, do not look at other people's possessions and think, I wish I had it. So even the statement that I keep five of the Ten Commandments may not be totally true. But certainly, uh, the first uh, five, you know, remember the Shabbos and the like, you know, you have to be pretty observant uh, to do that. But the question I want to raise is that people do have a sense that the Ten Commandments are uh, the most important thing. And yet, we know that all of the Torah ultimately comes from God. In fact, it's interesting that there is a widespread custom that when the Ten Commandments are read in the show, we stand up, meaning even if you don't stand up, some people stand up for all of the Torah reading, that's the custom of the yeshivos. But even if you don't stand up for the reading of the Torah, for the Ten Commandments, we all stand up. So there's an interesting responsa of the Rambam where he actually was critical of that custom because he cited a Talmudic ruling that it used to be the custom that the people would recite the Ten Commandments as part of the davening every day. And the sages discontinued that custom because they didn't want people to think that the only part of the Torah that's important is the Ten Commandments. They didn't want to give undue importance to the Ten Commandments. And therefore they discontinued making it part of the daily service. Now that's the Gemara. So Maimonides makes the <coughs> argument that if the sages were concerned with not overemphasizing the Ten Commandments so people shouldn't think that's the only part of the Torah you have to keep, by the same token you should not stand up when they read the Ten Commandments because that would imply that the rest of the Torah is of less importance. It's a very interesting response of the Rambam. Lamaisa, halachically, I have to say, we don't follow that, we do stand up. And the question becomes really, well, gee, is the Ten Commandments just like all of the Torah, which is holy and divine, or is there something special? Well, there has to be something special because those were the commandments that God chose to reveal to the 600,000 you know, Israelites, actually a total of 3 million if you count the women and the children. Meaning the rest of the Torah, God told Moshe and Moshe told us. But the part that we heard from Hashem with the thunder and the lightning and all of the miracles of Matan Torah were these 10 things. So we kind of have these two perspectives here. Perspective number one is, Ten Commandments are really, really special. Perspective number two is, it's part of the Torah. All of the Torah is divine, all of the Torah is good. This is no different than the rest of the Torah. It's like, which is it? So in reality, the Ramban kind of gives us a good handle on it. The Ramban says that the Ten Commandments are not just Ten Commandments. They are essentially an outline of the 613 commandments. In other words, the Ramban actually wrote a little book in which he actually shows how all of the 613 commandments can be subsumed under each of the Ten Commandments. So what gives the Ten Commandments their importance is the fact that they are an outline of everything else. So it's not that those particular commandments are more important, but from those particulars, we can infer and reconstruct all of the 613. Now that's not so easy if you start thinking about the details. I mean, let me give you one example. The laws of Kashrus. Now keeping kosher is obviously an important part of, of practicing Judaism. But where in the Ten Commandments is there any reference to the kashrut of food? Right, so the Ramban uh, goes into the idea of not murdering. That also means when, even when you kill animals, you do so in accordance with halakha. So some of it is a little forced, but the Ramban tries to show you every single commandment is included 
in the Ten Commandments. So when people say I only keep the Ten Commandments, <laughs> that has to be understood. Well, gee, do you keep the whole Torah? Because all of the Torah is in the Ten Commandments. Now, one point about the Ten Commandments that, that's actually very interesting is there's a famous distinction. Well, first of all, let, let, me, let, me, let me make two points about the shape of the commandments. You know, if you look at every representation, almost, of the luchot, of the tablets that Moshe bro uh, brought down, the first tablets, of course, he smashed because of the golden calf, and then he brought down second, but they have the same Ten Commandments. So you always see them, number one, that they're rounded on top, and number two, they're connected, like the two tablets are connected. The truth of the matter is, according to the Midrashim, both of those assumptions are incorrect. Number one, they were not connected. These are literally two pieces of stone that are not connected. And number two, they are not rounded on top, but uh, the luchot are either square or rectangled. And in fact, according to the Chachamim, the commandments uh, are engraved on all sides, meaning not only front and back, but even in the sides, the thickness. In other words, the luchot has a, had a certain thickness, and the commandments were on the, on the luchot, uh, and the thickness of the luchot. But be this it may, a very well-known distinction that is made is that the first five commandments are bain adam lamakom. They are between man and God. The second five commandments are interpersonal. Bain adam lechaveiro. Now let's test that just to see if, if, if that's true. The first commandment is, I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt from the house of slavery. Now, let's even stop there. Is that a commandment? A commandment means God says do something or God says don't do something. But the so-called first commandment is a declaration. I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt from the house of slavery. Why is that even a commandment? So Maimonides actually says it is a commandment. It is the commandment to believe in God. The commandment of Emuna. Now, that's Maimonides. Nachmanides, Ramban, raises a very interesting logical question. How can there be a commandment to believe in God? In other words, if I believe in God, I already believe in him. I don't believe in God, so who's commanding me to believe in him? It's like I tell an atheist, a person says he's an atheist, he doesn't believe in God. And I said, you can't be an atheist. He says, why not? He says, because God commanded you to believe in him. I mean, it's a non sequitur. You can only give a mitzvah in the name of God to somebody who believes in God. If I believe in God and then God commands me to do something so I have to listen. But God cannot command you logically to believe in him. So Nachmanides raises the fundamental question, how can there be a mitzvah of emuna? And yet Maimonides absolutely counts the first commandment, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, as a mitzvah of emunah. But the short answer would be, this is the answer that the Rambam himself would give, you're correct that the mitzvah of emunah cannot be directed to an atheist because he doesn't acknowledge the authority of the commandment. But it can be directed to a believer through tradition, meaning, let's assume I believe in God because my parents taught me that. And I grew up believing in God. But according to Maimonides, that's not sufficient. According to Maimonides, you must intellectually convince yourself by proper philosophical premises of the existence of God. Emuna, according to Rambam, is not blind faith. Emuna, according to Rambam, is intellectual and philosophical understanding 
of the belief that you have. So, so based on that understanding, the mitzvah of Amunah is now very sensible. God is commanding the believer through tradition to internalize that belief through rational philosophical thought. What's interesting is that uh, in the course of Jewish history, uh, many have taken an opposite position from Maimonides and they have actually stressed the dangers of philosophical speculation regarding the existence of God because they considered that a Pandora's box, meaning if, if, if I believe in God, because that's the way I was raised, so Maimonides would say, not good enough. You got to make your independent investigation to convince yourself of that truth. That's what Maimonides would say. But quite a few other people would say, it's fine, don't open up the box because you don't know if it'll take you to a bad place. And that's why to this very day, uh, there's a lot of debate. Should one study the Guide to the Perplexed? Should one study uh, different philosoph the Chovas Halavavas, chapter one, Shar uh, Hayichud, the Gate of Unity, right? That's why uh, very often you will actually find people shying away from it as opposed to the Rambam's view. Now, uh, in modern times, uh, Rav Noach Weinberg, of blessed memory, was a very, very strong proponent of Maimonides' view, and he carried it out in Asia Torah, and I imagine it's probably still done there, in which it's very important to have a strong philosophical grounding in more, let's say, Hasidic yeshivos or the like, and even non-Hasidic yeshivos, there's often an emphasis in not going in that particular direction, because as the saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, meaning why create questions uh, if one does not have those questions, but But be it as it may, I just want to go over the five commandments and see if they're bein adam la makam. So belief in God obviously is. The second commandment is a negative. You shall not have any other gods besides me, meaning there's only one God. Of course, one might also metaphorically interpret, don't have other things in your life that take the place of God, like money, power, politics, and your own self-gratification. Thou shalt not have any other gods. There are many false gods that people have besides idols. Okay. Commandment number three, do not take the name of God in vain. So uh, we don't mention the name of Hashem, you know, in casual conversation and the like. We, that's why we say, in fact, that's why we say Hashem. H Hashem means the name. We don't pronounce God's name. I mean, in English it is actually permitted. That's why I said God, but we don't say the Ado, you know, thing. And Kalvachomer, we don't say the Tetragrammaton, the Yudke Vavke, because we don't take God's name in vain. Okay, that's fine. Commandment number four, remember the Shabbos to keep it holy. That, of course, is our relationship to God, to commemorate the creation of the world. But commandment number five is really interesting. Commandment number, number five is to honor your father and mother. Hmm. Now, honoring my father and mother is an interpersonal behavior between one human being, the son or the daughter, and other human beings, the father and the mother. So L'chaira, if I were to ask you, is kibbut aviyem, a bein adam la makom, between man and God, or bein adam l'chaveiro, between man and man, I would have classified it as man and man. Right? So why is it in the first five? Now, let the second five are all interpersonal, just to go over it quickly. They're very staccato. Uh, don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal, although that means kidnapping, but okay. Uh, don't uh, give false testimony against another person. And don't covet. Don't be jealous of another person's possessions, which, is, as, as I said before, is actually a very hard mitzvah to properly fulfill. Okay, so the second five are all interpersonal in one way or the other, so that's pretty good. Bein adam l'chaveiro. But our problem is column one. Column one is said to be bein adam la makam, between man and God. What do we do about kibbut aviyem? Kibbut aviyem belongs in the second tablet. Of course, that would make it a four and a six, but okay. 
uh, putting aside the symmetry problem, why does it belong there? So in reality, there are a few things to be said about this. Uh, one idea is that kibbut aviyem, the essence of honoring my parents, even if I thought my parents were not so good to me, and Baruch Hashem, most of the time people, parents do enormous investments of time and love and energy in raising children. But you know the halacha is that even if my parents gave me up for adoption when I was one hour old, and they didn't do anything for me in my life, I still owe them honor and reverence because they gave me life. And the, without life, there's nothing else that you could accomplish. So every single thing you accomplish in your, war, in your existence is because your parents gave you life. <coughs> so the essence of Kiba Davim is gratitude for life. So the idea is, if I'm grateful to my parents for giving me life, I will ultimately extrapolate that to be grateful to God, who is the source of life. So Kiba Davim is a stepping stone towards appreciation of God. And that's why it's called the Bein Adam La Makam, because when you are grateful for life, and therefore you're grateful to your parents, you will be grateful to God, who is the source of life. That's a very, very important idea. And in fact, that's why the Torah says the reward for kibbut aviyim is long life. Why is that so? Because kibbut aviyim means I appreciate my life. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, in, in the legal system, at least in the United States, I don't know how it is in Israel, uh, there is a, a lawsuit or a legal cause of action called wrongful death, meaning to say uh, if someone kills somebody, so besides the criminal prosecution, the family can bring a lawsuit for damages based on wrongful death. And by the way, that can even work if a person is acquitted. That ha that's what happened with O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson was tried for murder. He was acquitted by the jury. The family of his uh, victim, his ex-wife, sued him for damages wrongful death, and indeed there was a multi-million dollar judgment against him, uh, which he you know, was not able to pay. So that's called wrongful death. But it's interesting that in some states, uh, there's been some experimentation with a lawsuit that's called wrongful life, in which a kid brings a lawsuit alleging that they didn't want to be born, and they're suing their parents for having them born. They would rather have been dead. Now, um, sometimes it's, they sue the doctor because of a messed up abortion, a botched abortion. And indeed, you know, sometimes that means there may be physical and mental disabilities uh, because of that. They said they were better dead. But many states refuse to recognize a wrongful life action because they say it's against the public policy of a legal system to say you're better off dead than alive kind of against the basic moral judgment. So most of us indeed are grateful for life. And kibbut aviyem is gratitude to parents for life, therefore gratitude to God. But I would, I would like to suggest there may be a deeper reason why kibbut aviyem is linked to God, not just interpersonal. And that is the image that a person forms of God at least initially, is largely based on the relationship they have with their parents. Because when a child comes into the world, a baby, parents are very godlike. Right? Parents are kind of the source of everything. In fact, there's a certain time in childhood development, of course they grow out of it very quickly, uh, where the father, or the, maybe the father, I, mean, I remember this, the father is like all powerful, you know, the strongest person, right? He could knock, you know, this person across the street or lift up a car, like Superman. And the child looks up to the parent like a godlike figure that can do everything. As I say, the kids grow out of that uh, relatively quickly. Uh, <laughs> we lose that aura, kind of missed that, but okay, we lose that aura. But the notion is this, because a child is so under the control of the parent, 
the parent does have a godlike role. So here's the thing. If I look at my parents as loving, supportive, compassionate, caring, that's how I'm going to feel God is, because God is described as our parents. God is Ovinu. If I look at my parents as abusive, unpredictable, capricious, never know what his mood or her mood is going to be, and yet they have this control over me, that's kind of how I'm going to view God. You know, it's not that uncommon that people are scared of God. Now, now in, in a sense, even within traditional Judaism, there is this notion of fear of God, but that's primarily, primarily reverence. But there are people that are scared of God in the same way they would be scared of an unpredictable, capricious, abusive parent. Now, you might say, well, okay, maybe that's how a kid thinks. But you know, I grow up. I become 20, 30, 40. What, because of my relationship with my parents, that's how I'm going to view God? I mean, don't I develop in some way? Well, you do. But it would be surprising how we don't at the same time. Meaning, in a way, it's disheartening because you figure if I'm 40 years old, I shouldn't be going through the traumas of a five-year-old. I mean, life should go on, shouldn't it? Yeah, I suppose it should. But, sadly, it doesn't always. You'd be quite amazed, or maybe from your own experience perhaps, you, you wouldn't be amazed, how things, feelings, that, happened so, that, that, that were triggered by events that happened so long ago, continue to circulate and recirculate. So, in a sense, here's the thing. The mitzvah of honoring parents as an obligation is an obligation on the child. But it contains a message to the parent as well. Meaning in the mitzvah of honoring parents, there's a commandment implicit on the parents to be honorable people. People who become worthy of the honor. Because the way you parent is the way your child will understand God. And that is why Kibbut Aviyem is in column one rather than column two because the image that we form of God is very, very connected to the image we have of our own parents. Because in our early stages in life, our parents are godlike in terms of all powerful and, and, and the like. So it's an important idea that uh, when, we, when we parents, we should try to be people who will be worthy of honor, worthy of respect, role models that our children can genuinely look up to. And to serve, as it were, this may sound pretentious, but to literally serve as kind of a surrogate of God, a surrogate representation of God. So I can tell my child, right? Uh, I mean, a simple example. A child asks, would, would ask a parent, uh, how do I know, does God love me? So I could say back to my child, do I love you? If the child feels secure, the child says, oh, I know you love me. So I can say something like, the way you talk to a child, well, Take the way I love you and multiply it a million billion times. That's how much God loves you. Well, if the child is secure in my love, he can do the multiplication and he'll feel good about that. But if the child, you know, doesn't feel that love from the parent, then he has nothing to multiply, right? Or he'll multiply the, the negative. You know, God is a billion times more than I am. Well, okay, if I'm abusive and mean, oy vey, you know, that's what God is, abusive and mean. Uh, that's going to be a, a bad thing. So, kibbut aviyem is not only an obligation on a child, it's also an obligation on a parent to be the type of parent who, who imitates God in that way. Now, here's another point about the five ben adam and the five ben adam 
and this is an interesting observation of the Mabitz. Mabitz is an abbreviation, Moshe ben Yosef Trani, and he was a great rabbi in Sfat in the time of Rav Yosef Cairo. So we're talking about the 1500s. In fact, uh, it's interesting, that he, was, he was obviously, uh, Rav Yosef Cairo was the Rav of Sfat, and the Mabit was the head of the Bastin of Sfat. So Rav Mabit was a very, very prominent person. But uh, there, it seems that his relationship with Rav Yosef Cairo sometimes had some tensions in it. In fact, they had a big, big debate about Shemitah, and at one point Rav Yosef Cairo threatens he would put the Mabit in excommunication if the Mabit didn't uh, retract his position on Shemitah and the like. So apparently there was some tension in terms of halachic rulings. But in addition to the Mabit being a very great posek of Jewish law, he was also a Jewish philosopher, and he wrote a book of Jewish philosophy called Beis Elohim, The House of God. And he makes a very interesting observation. He says, if you notice the first five commandments and the second five commandments, the first five commandments have many more words than the second five. Right? The second five are staccato. The second five are very short. Lo tirzach, don't murder. Lo tinov, don't commit adultery. Lo signo, right? They're like uh, very, very short. The first five commandments are long statements. Now, we do have a tradition that the, the, the engraving of the commandments took up the same amount of space on each tablet. So that would mean by definition, if you have fewer words taking up the same amount of space, the font size, or maybe the engraving size, I don't know if you use fonts for engraving, but the size of the engraved letters on the second tablet must have been larger than the size of the engraving on the first tablet. Because the first tablet had more words that it had to fit on the same space. Now, that would mean the following. When Moshe is bringing down the luchos, okay, the first luchos B'nai Yisrael never saw because they were smashed. But let's talk about the second luchos on Yom Kippur. When he's bringing down the second luchos, min ha-shamayim, and you see Moshe coming down the mountain from a distance, and you put on your glasses to try to read the engraving, which commandments will you be able to see first? The Bein Adam Lamakom or the Bein Adam Lechaveiro? The Mabit says it'll clearly be the Bein Adam Lechaveiro because they're larger. So this is an important point because sometimes people think that the most important part of Judaism are the ritualistic and ceremonial commandments. And of course they are important, God forbid, we cannot denigrate them. Shabbos, keeping kosher, by family purity. But then people pay less attention sometimes to business ethics, to honesty, to being nice to people. Avat Yisrael, oh, that's been Adam Lechavero, that's less, less significant. The Mabit <coughs> says you actually see the opposite. That the Bein Adam Lechavero was seen by the Jewish people first, because the Torah is emphasizing the primacy of the Bein Adam L'chaveiro. So this is an observation of the Mabit. Okay, so now let's go backwards a little bit uh, to, where, to, to when the Jewish people do come to the Sinai Desert and prepare themselves for Matan Torah. So the Pasuk says, Bachodesh Hashlishi. It was the third month Remember, Nisan is always the first month. That's the month of the Exodus. Eor is the second month. Sivan is the first month. On Rosh Chodesh Sivan, B'nai Yisrael came to Midbar Sinai and they prepared for Matan Torah six days, getting the Ten Commandments on the sixth of Sivan. That's why Shavuos is on the sixth of Sivan. So, the Pasuk Aleph says, the third month after they left Egypt, on that day, boom, Midbar Sinai, they came to mid the, the Sinai Desert. Okay. So, Pasuk Aleph already tells me they're at, they're at uh, Mount Sinai. 
Pasuk Beis then seems to go backwards. It says, they left Rafidim, which was the prior oasis. Vayavo Midbar Sinai, and they came to the Sinai Desert. Vayachanu Ba Midbar, and they encamped in that desert. And then it repeats, Vayichan Sham Yisrael, they encamped there next to the mountain. The Orachayim HaKadosh asks Akasha that the whole second verse is redundant. It is not giving me any new information. The fact that we were in a place called Rafidim before we came to Sinai, we know that because the end of Parshas B'Shalach says we came to the oasis of Rafidim and that's where we had war with Amalek. So I know we were in Rafidim from the end of B'Shalach and I know we came to the Sinai Desert because the first Pusik in the chapter says we came to the Sinai Desert. So why does Pusik Bey say we left Rafidim and we came to the Sinai Desert? We know that. Moreover, even in, within the Pusik itself there's redundancy. After it says we came to the Sinai Desert, it then says we camped there. Well, sure, you come there, that's where you're, you're camping. And after it says we camped there, it repeats, Vayichan, we camped there. <laughs> so, number one, the whole Pasuk is not telling me anything new. And number two, the Pasuk is repetitive within itself. We came to the Sinai Desert. We camped in the Sinai Desert. We camped adjacent to the mountain. Why are you saying all of these things? So the Arachayim offers a very beautiful explanation. And the Arachayim says that Pasuk Beis, the second chapter, is not describing the geographical travel of the Jewish people. We know that they left Rafidim and they came to the Sinai Desert, Mount Sinai. But Pasuk Beis is describing the spiritual journey the Jewish people had to take in order to prepare to receive the Torah. There's a certain preparation that you need to be worthy of receiving God's Torah. And the Arachayim identified four elements, a four-point plan in making yourself worthy of receiving God's Torah. And he reads the four-point plan into this Pasuk, they left Rafidim. So let's look at each part of the Pasuk and identify it with the particular characteristic that we need to have. The oasis of Rafidim, we read at the end of B'Shalach, that is where Amalek attacked us. And Amalek attacked us in Rafidim, etc. But Chazal point out that Rafidim is not just a place, but it's a certain attitude. Rafidim is an acronym or a contraction of Rafu Yedehem Minat Torah, which literally means it's an idiom, so, so the literal translation is not self explanatory. Rafu Yedehem Minat Torah is your hands are weak with the Torah. You're holding on to the Torah in a very casual way. An example would be, let's imagine you're crossing, uh, let's say King George Street, right? Busy street, a lot of cars. So if you're holding your baby in your arms, you hold the baby very tight. You don't want to drop it, God forbid. If, however, you have this used tissue in your hand, even if you're not a litterer, you don't deliberately litter, okay, you're good in that way, but you know, you may hold it loosely, so if it blows out of your hand, you know, ah, okay, no big deal. So the phrase, your hands are loose, represents an idiom that means indifferent, lack of interest, boredom, complacency. 
Chazal teach us a very important idea. There is this Amalek out there that's a vicious enemy that tries to destroy us. But the Amalek out there is generated by an inner Amalek. The power of the outer Amalek is based on an inner Amalek within us. When we eradicate the inner Amalek, the outer Amalek disappears. It's actually very similar. <laughs> I hate to use this as a dimian. What was it? Um, there was a whole series of horror movies. Nightmare at Elm Street or something. One of those things. And the conceit of the movie was very, very interesting. That your nightmares generated external realities. That your thoughts, your nightmares, created the monsters. Without the nightmares, the monsters would have no power. In Kabbalah, <laughs> there actually is a very similar idea. Your attitudes, our thoughts, our feelings, our attitudes, create external realities. So, as I'll say, yeah, there is this vicious beast called Amalek out there tries to destroy you. But the Amalek out there gets power from the Amalek within me. So what is the Amalek within me? Rafidim, lack of passion, complacency, not being excited in Avodat Hashem. That is the cancer within that empowers the Amalek outside. That is why Amalek attacked us in Rafidim, when it's Rafu Yedehem in a Torah. Amalek is empowered. Now this is a very somber thought in many ways, because this means that even if a person is observant, is from, keeps the commandments, but they still may have an attitude of refidim. They go through the motions. They do things superficially. They do things without love of God and reverence for God. Now, don't misunderstand. It's better to do the mitzvahs even without passion than not to do the mitzvahs. If somebody were to say, oh, I don't have the passion, so I'm going to forget about it. We would say, no, no, it's, I mean, whatever you do is good. It's better to do than not to do. But ultimately, you're not really achieving the full purpose of things unless there's a passion. In Yiddish, we call it a geschmack, a real pleasure in what you're doing. Rav Moshe Feinstein used to say, the old Yiddish saying, Maybe you heard it from your parents or grandparents. It's hard to be a Jew. It is schwer to sein it. And people say it half humorously, but he actually said, maybe with some exaggeration, that this ruined a whole generation of Jews during the Depression, during the 1920s. Because if they hear day in and day out, it's hard to be a Jew, then when they're able to escape Judaism, they'll do it. I don't want to live a hard life if I don't have to. And indeed, it was hard to be a Jew in those days, especially. So there was justification for what they said, but still, that, that poisons the attitude. You know, children pick up on this very, very uh, clearly. Children pick up on everything. Uh, <laughs> you have to be careful, right? Kids see everything, they process everything. You know, sometimes uh, you got to leave the house to do, you know, to to get angry or whatever it is. And um, kids pick up if Torah life is a burden to their parents. You can have a friend person, but everything's a burden. Getting up for davening is a burden. Learning is a burden. Shabbos is a burden. Cleaning for Pesach is a burden. A kid absorbs that the parents don't really, they do it, they have a strong sense of duty, and that's very admirable. That is admirable. But if they just see the duty part and they don't see the joy and the simcha, then at best, that's how they're going to grow up. And at worst, 
They'll leave it. Because they'll say, hey, I don't want to be a martyr. I don't want to live a life of suffering. So, the Orach Hayim says, when the Pasuk says they traveled from Rafidim, listen to how he's, it doesn't refer to the physical journey from the place called Rafidim to Sinai. We already know they took that journey. But it refers to a spiritual journey. You, you want to accept the Torah? You must leave the complacency and frustration and lack of interest in the word Rafidim, Rafu Yedeim in a Torah, and embrace the Torah with joy, with passion, with excitement, with a sense of renewal. You see? Vayisu mi Rafidim. Leave the status of Rafidim. Rafu Yedeim in a Torah. Okay. So that's element number one. Embrace Judaism with excitement and passion. Now, there is a problem here. Uh, the Orachim doesn't tell you how you do that. I mean, that's going to be an immediate problem. Okay, great. I'm given an instruction. Be enthusiastic. Mm, okay. Be enthusiastic. What, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do exactly? That's going, so that really requires a great deal of creativity, a great deal of thought. Uh, in learning, you try to find topics that excite you, that interest you, and it may not be the standard curriculum uh, in a yeshiva or whatever it is. But that's why Chazal prays very much. Learning mashal libo chafetz. To learn those things that the heart desires. Uh, you try to find ways to I don't want to, I was going to, I was going to say, make Judaism fun. Now, now again, uh, not everything in life has to be fun. In fact, sometimes even very hard things can be very enjoyable and meaningful. But the sense of fun is like an excitement in doing it. It is chad shutz in doing it. It's a very important thing. Okay. But I want to finish the other elements. So then, then it says, they came to this uh, Midbar Sinai and they encamped in the Midbar. So you'll notice the word Midbar is mentioned twice. They came to the Midbar, and they encamped in the Midbar. So here the Arachayim says, Midbar represents two more elements, elements two and three, as part of our spiritual preparation, and that is why Midbar is mentioned twice, because there are two comparisons to Midbar that we internalize as part of our preparation for Matan Torah. The first is, the Midbar, <coughs> a pure Midbar at least, is very devoid of materialism. In fact, many people find a beauty in the desert because you don't have buildings, you don't even have a lot of plants. There's a certain emptiness of the Midbar. And therefore, that represents an environment that is devoid of excess materialism. So the Archaim says the second aspect to Kabbalah Satora is to disengage from excessive materialistic pursuits of accumulating more and more wealth or property or stuff or things. Now, this too is a little complicated because Judaism does not renounce property. Judaism does not require poverty. Judaism understands that a certain level of material comfort can help a person even spiritually. As I'll say, that a, a beautiful home can enlarge a person's mind and expand their consciousness. But still, it's true that if you are overly preoccupied with materialism, your heart is less sensitive to spirituality. And there's actually a reason for that. The reason for that is that material pleasures tend to be immediate short-term pleasures. Spiritual pleasures require much more work and they take time. And once you're habituated to instant gratification, it's very difficult to focus on things that require a longer buildup. 
So the Archaim says there does have to be a certain amount of disengagement from the rat race, from materialism. Be like a desert that's kind of empty, devoid. And again, even many photographers, they love deserts precisely because of that emptiness. It's not, there's not a lot of stuff that clutters up the mind. So that's one aspect of desert. Right, so element one was passion and excitement. Element two is a disengagement from excessive materialism. Now element three, which is the second mention of midbar, is a midbar is also a symbol of humility because it's not filled with itself. And that is the second element, I'm sorry, the third element, and that is a person must be humble. Now it's interesting, Chazal make the point with an opposite metaphor. Why the Torah is compared to water. Just as water goes from high ground to low ground, the Torah goes from the arrogant to the humble. So it's fascinating. Desert and water are almost opposites. But the same point emerges. Torah is compared to water because it requires humility. Uh, midbar is a requirement of Torah because the midbar is humble and unpretentious in not having a lot of stuff. Humility is a primary quality in God's Torah for a very simple reason. If a person is arrogant, Balgaiva, they're unwilling to learn from others, they're unwilling to admit that they don't understand something. So a Balgaiva will be very, uh, very, it'll be very difficult for a Balgaiva to truly learn because he'll never be willing to accept from anybody or admit when they're wrong. So humility is a very important condition in Torah. So we've identified travel from Rafidim, come to the desert, which is the first uh, mention, disengagement from materialism, camp in the desert, which is humility, and then the Torah repeats, and they camped by the mountain. Well, you already said they're camping there. So Rashi already answers this one, that the verb, the first time it says they camped, it's Lashon Rabim, plural, Vayachanu. The second time they camped, or the second reference to camping, even though we translate it, they camped, but in reality, see in English, you're not gonna, in Engl English does not have a different verb form for singular and plural, Hebrew does. The word camp at the end of the verse is Lashon Yachid, individual. Vayichan Shom Yisrael. Rashi says, why does it say Vayichan? Not the plural, Vayachanu. So Rashi says, they were like Ish Echad Uvalev Echad. They were like one person with one heart. Called Achtos, unity. Avas Yisrael. To accept God's Torah? There must be unity among the Jewish people. When there's not unity, then I myself cannot accept God's Torah. I need a Jewish nation. I need a unified nation. In fact, this is uh, one of the drushes they give in the Haggadah. Uh, you know, we're coming up to Pesach, actually. It's already less than a month to Purim, and then Pesach, hey, then, right? All the holidays are hitting you now. You look so frustrated, so scared. What, right, right? <laughs> Pesach, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I got you. I, I, I hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, but here's the thing. So we have the Dayenus, right? Everyone knows the famous Dayenus. If God would have just done this, Dayenu, it's enough, it's enough, it's enough. So one of them is hard to understand. If God would have brought us to Mount Sinai and not given us the Torah, Dayenu, that would have been enough to be grateful. Well, why is that? I mean, Mount Sinai was valuable. 
because we got the Torah. What would have been so great about coming to Mount Sinai and not getting the Torah? What's the Dayenu? It would have been enough to be grateful. By the way, Dayenu, I just I just, I want to point out, doesn't mean it would have been enough. It certainly wouldn't have been enough. But it would have been enough to say thank you. That's all. In other words, Dayenu never means it would have been enough. But even so, even if you interpret, like I just said, it's enough to say thank you. What's the thank you? Thank you for what? You brought us to Mount Sinai? So one of the Mepharshim answers that because at Mount Sinai we achieved ish echad uvalev echad, unity, that is such a wonderful thing that even if it wouldn't have resulted in us getting the Torah, dayenu, it would have been enough to be thankful. Okay. So the Orachayim gives us a very neat four-point plan. What did the Jewish people need to do in order to be worthy of receiving God's Torah? Passion and excitement. Disengagement from excessive materialism. Humility and willingness to learn from others. And a sense of unity and love. When you have those four elements together, you've made yourself a receptacle to receive God's Torah. Now, the four steps that the Jewish people had to take are relevant for us as well. You know, Ramban actually says, Nachmanides, there's a mitzvah every day to remember the giving of the Torah at Sinai. That just as there is a mitzvah every day to remember that God took us out of Egypt, and that for sure there is, Ramban adds, there's a mitzvah to remember and experience Mount Sinai. Because every day we have to accept God's Torah anew. If that is true, then it would stand to reason that if every single day we are reliving Matan Torah, <coughs> then the same elements, the same steps the Jewish people needed to take to accept God's Torah, we need to take in our own lives to accept God's Torah every day of our lives. Right? Those would be the elements of enthusiasm, the elements of trying to strive for a simpler life, but not so much material acquisition, humility, and avas Yisrael, and unity. And these are the four elements that we try to incorporate in our lives in order to accept HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Torah. Right? Because once again, it's not just a historical thing. It is a process that we have to go through mamash, day by day by day. You know, um, and that's what Chazal say. Kol yom biyom yiyu be'inecha kechadoshim. Every single day you have to look at the mitzvahs of the Torah as if they are new, as if you're doing them for the first time. Which means they shouldn't be, shouldn't be done out of road, they shouldn't be done good boring, etc. It's exciting, it's a new, it's a new thing. In fact, I'll just end with a uh, beautiful Hasidic Shavuot. Uh, in the uh, David Hashem Ori, which is the psalm that we recite during the month of Elul until after uh, the end of Sukkot, so David HaMelech says, famous uh, Pasuk that's been set to music a number of times, Achas Shaltim Yes Hashem, there is one thing I ask from Hashem, Osa Vakesh, this is what I request. Shifti Beves Hashem call you Mechayai. May I dwell in the house of God all the days of my life. Lachsos Benayam Hashem to see the pleasantness or the sweetness of Hashem. Ulavakir Behechalo and to visit his temple. So the Svarim point out there's a contradiction. He says he wants to dwell in the house of God all the days of his life. He wants to be a permanent resident. And then he says, and I want to be able to visit. 
Well, what does he want? Does he want, to, uh, did he want to be a citizen? Or does he want to be a tourist? How can he say, I want to dwell in the house of God all the days of my life? And then he says, well, Levake, I want to visit. So the Sifra Hasidah say that David HaMelech is praying for, for two things. He wants to serve God all of his life. But he wants to have the enthusiasm of the first-time person. The mushal they give is tefillin. You know, bar mitzvah boy, again, I apologize to the women who don't, may not have had this experience, although you never know, maybe some did. Uh, but uh, a bar mitzvah boy looks forward to wearing tefillin. It's a real, real big thing. And finally, whether it's a month before or two months before or even two weeks before, puts on tefillin. It's so exciting, so geschmack. He's not one of the big boys. Tefillin, a real sign of adulthood. And then what happens is, the weeks turn into months, the months turn into years, the years turn into decades. After a while, you do it uh, six days a week, you don't have the same excitement. Things fade, you get jaded. David Amalek says, I want to serve God all the days of my life, but I should have the same excitement as the first time visitor. Herod Yisrael is very much the same way, and this indeed is something that men and women can identify with. You know, the first time you come to Israel, uh, let's say typically on a trip, before Aliyah, or maybe sometimes as, as an Ola the first time, such excitement, such passion. I remember the first time I was in Eretz Israel was in uh, 1979. I had graduated law school and uh, my uh, parents, the Chronum of Racha, uh, bought me a trip to Israel and I have to say it was not, there was a big, big, big financial sacrifice for them. But they wanted me to have this, this trip. And wow, which was so exciting, it's like first love, you know. So exciting, you know, the buses, oh, so great to be on the buses, and whatever it is. Uh, we, in those days, we took Arab buses too, which is an interesting, today, we, you know, people don't do that anymore. But uh, there were goats on the buses, chickens on the buses, all, all sorts of interesting. It, so everything was fascinating. Now then, you know, come back, you get older, etc. cetera, you, you, you live here, you see some of the frustrations so sometimes our attitudes may not be as positive and as joyous as it was the first time. We get jaded. In fact, uh, Rav Hutner was asked uh, when he came to Eretz Yisrael, what did he miss about Chutz Oretz? So he said he missed uh, in Chutz Oretz his yearning to be in Israel. Like when you're not here, or you're a visitor or a tourist, there's just that great like, love that you have. When you're here, well, you know, this problem, that problem, that problem. So David HaMelech is praying that he wants both constancy and passion. That the passion shouldn't diminish with the constancy. And that's what Chazal mean in the Torah generally. Call Yom B'Yom every single day the Torah should be as if you're getting it the very first time. So as we're reading about Matan Torah, we should be Zoha to try to re-accept Hashem's Torah in our hearts and in our souls and try to follow the Orachayim's four Klalim that will help us to do so. So have Shavua Tov and have a wonderful Shabbos. Oh, it's a, 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 it's a,